Hello there and welcome to this video. I'm glad you've, you've decided to check it out. My name is Matt Petrowski. I love teaching about FileMaker. We are learning a lot of cool stuff and in today's lesson, this very video, we're going to be taking a look at managing users in our solutions. So stick with me, we'll be on my desktop in just a few. Alrighty, welcome to my desktop. Now, if you've been following along with this series, then you know that we've been using the same file and we're going through this file and we're adding new features. Of course, every video that I shoot here on YouTube, I like to give you a little bit of something so that even if you haven't been following along, you can actually pick up something new in FileMaker that you can add to your own solution. Now, if you do want to follow this series and you wanna do it in sequence, you can simply just click on the channel icon here on the YouTube page that will take you to my channel, and then you will see the different sets of videos or the series that I've been creating. So far there's been three of them, and you can follow those. I suggest you start with the first series and go through those videos and then build up. It's the best way to learn FileMaker from the ground up. Otherwise, let's just check out what we're learning in this video. Now, there is a link down below in the description area of this video, and you're able to access the file that I'm going to be using. We have a couple of reference files and um, other items. I'm going to just choose, I already have the database loaded, by the way. Um, time track is the name of the file that we're working with, and it's just a simple time tracker. I've used FileMaker's file as a comparison, the one that they provide with FileMaker. I am using a copy of FileMaker 16, by the way, but guaranteed most of what you learn here will probably work within most versions of FileMaker, 13, 14, 15, uh, and beyond because FileMaker only adds uh, incremental changes and most of the core of how you do things really doesn't change. So this video in particular, um, doesn't matter what version of FileMaker you have, you're going to be able to follow along. So with our file here, what we're doing is we're taking a slight deviation and there's always something to learn in FileMaker. And here's one trick that I wanna give you because currently as our project stands, we have a couple of issues. For example, when I click on this projects button, you'll notice that you're not going to be able to add a new project. And of course, if you haven't been following along, then this looks like an absolute horrendous mess. At least it does to me. And I'm really looking forward to the design section that we're going to get to. But you notice that I can't click in here to actually add a record. And uh, there's also a problem that, let's say, for example, I'm selected on project three right here, and I click on projects, and now I want to make project three be an inactive project. I select on that right there, and then I click, and I get this funky thing. No records are present. When I click in this blank area, there's so many little things that are issues about this database. Now, a lot of developers will keep track of all of these things outside of the FileMaker database, but a long time ago, one of the things that I decided to do was to cr uh, create a script in the manage scripts, which we're going to go into with command shift S. And one of the things that I do is at the beginning of all of the scripts, I use it and take the opportunity to use the scripts because you're in and out of these areas of FileMaker so often to start to create a to-do list. So what we're learning right this very second has nothing to do with manage users. We're going to get to that but I wanna to start to track things in my solution and I want to show you how I do that and I simply use a script. So many times I will create this script and it'll simply just be called to do. As we can see right there, then I call that. With that to do, I can now just start to add comments of things that I want to fix. And of course I can drag this up to the very top and put that at the very beginning. Of course, there's one other script that I do add initially to every FileMaker solution that I have, and that's a version tracking script. Let's add that one. I'm going to click the plus, and I'm just simply going to put in a version number, 1.0, or maybe you want version 0 0.5 or something like that. It really doesn't matter what you name the script because the name of a script can always change, and the way that FileMaker references scripts within the script workspace is using an internal ID. It's how you can always rename something flexibly within FileMaker. But FileMaker has this really cool function we'll take a look at quickly here. I'm only going to add one single step to the script. It is exit script. And the only thing that I'm going to exit here with is get script name. Now, what is the script name at this point in time? 
it's 0.5. If I double click and rename this script to 1.0, what's going to be returned from this script when it runs, when exit script is actually called just one single step, it's going to return the script name. The script name, therefore, is 1.0. So if I make a new version of this file, what do you think I do? I just change the name of the script to 1.1. Now we'll see later down the road that this is really helpful, but this is a great way when you are working on multiple versions of the same file to know which one is which. You as the developer, you know that maybe you're on version 1.2. And if you open an older copy of the file and you see the very first script is 1.1 or 1.0, you instantly know, oh, I opened the wrong copy of the same file. And it does happen. So that's the one of the first scripts I put in there. Now for the to-do, I just put in comment steps. So we select right here and we put in a comment step and I'm going to put in um, fix creating records in popover. In popover. And then I'll just duplicate that. I did that with Command or Shift D rather than taking the time to actually hit the comment again. And this one, what I really like when you're doing comments is you can do a lot of this stuff with the keyboard. The space bar in particular, which I just tapped, will allow me to start to edit this comment. So a quick little Command D and then the space bar gets you right into the next comment you want to make. And what else is that we have? Um, we had the uh, an ability to add new records and also the uh, fix active, uh, non-active projects value list and what is actually going to happen with that. So that's just a little opener for this video. A quick little tips I like to give you in terms of how I develop and what I do when I develop. Now we can head into that user management stuff. All right, we'll close everything out of the script workspace and hopefully those tips are helpful. Thank you for letting me know, FileMaker. All right, so in every FileMaker database, well, I shouldn't say every, you can create a FileMaker database and that database can be created for the purpose of just a general tool that you and you alone are going to use. When we, use, when we take a look at my reference database, Time Tracker, this database I had created for myself. I never had the intention of this being a multi-user database, but I'm teaching you how to develop in FileMaker for the purpose of a multi-user environment because FileMaker is multi-user. Now the first place where you're going to go, and we can always see whether a database is multi-user or not by simply going to the file, looking at the manage and looking at the security. Um, ignore that there is no password. I can see when I click on use detailed setup, that's what I'm used to as a FileMaker developer and as a developer yourself, if you're going to be doing that, this is where you have the greatest degree of control and security. Again, ref uh, go reference one of the previous videos where we talked about managed security in the environment section. So here I see I only have an admin account. I've not created any additional accounts. This was just a database for me. Well, we need to fix that because we're going to be testing our solution against different privilege sets. So as I hide this version, my reference database, we're going to do the same thing in our file and we're going to go to manage security and we're going to set up some additional items as a prefix to what we're going to be editing down the road. So first off, I'm going to create a new privilege set. That privilege set is going to be, um, you can call it whatever because you can always rename users and I'll just put in general users. And we're not doing a, a, a security video, but we'll need to go into that. For right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that users can create and edit in all tables because I may not want to let them uh, delete. I'm going to say they can view all layouts and they can view all uh, value lists and they can only execute all scripts. Now I could spend a whole video talking about all these different settings and what your approach should be when you decide to set one setting versus another. It'll be a good video but one thing you need to remember in particular is bare minimum you typically with a privilege set if users are going to be coming into this database you will typically need to check the option of how many different ways these this user can use this particular log into this database. For example, if I do not check FileMaker network, that means that when I put this on FileMaker server, any users that have this role when they try to log in, it will say you do not have the, the correct privilege in order to do this, which is very confusing and it's 
many times just because you haven't checked this box. Well, let this particular privilege, privilege set access FileMaker through the network. Also with this privilege set, we want to uh, turn on typically all menus. Unless you know that you want a minimum set of uh, menus or editing only, all is what most users that are taught how to use FileMaker are going to be used to. So now that we have a basic privilege set, and we're going to ignore all of these for right now, we can set up a new account. Now I'm not going to go into um, external uh, authentication using Active Directory. It's a wonderful way to work with your users. We currently have an admin password. I'm going to create a new account that is going to be just a general user. Now one of the things that I do is I create a uh, test user account. And I do this for myself as the developer because it's always very easy to come in here and easily say, well, this is an inactive account at the point that I'm in time of time that I'm going to uh, deploy. So right now as I'm developing this, I'm not thinking about users and the actual users that are going to be using this database. I'm just thinking about the classification of a user. In this case, it's a user that's going to log in because I'm going to need to test that myself logging in and out. And in particular for this video, we will need that. Now again, I can, because I'm developing locally here, I can leave this as a no password database. But typically you're uploading the database to FileMaker server and testing it that way. Since I'm completely on my machine here, it's no big deal. But if you are uploading a database to server, always, always, always give those uh, users a password. And you can always choose this option, require a password change the very next time. So this is the whole scenario. You send the user an email, hey, you've got a new account on the system and uh, your password is this. As soon as they log in, it prompts for a new password. FileMaker will do that for us. So we set the privilege set to our user privilege set. Everything should be good here. We say, okay, we've got our two accounts now, our admin account and our test account. Both of them for the purpose of us while we're developing our blank passwords. And it says one of the accounts, the full access does not have the password. Do you want to do this? Sure. I say admin blank and I say, okay, good. All right. So now we have at least two different classes of users, a full access account, and we have a general user that's going to log in. Later down the road, we will modify the privilege settings. So what we need now is we need to talk about what is the distinction between the area that we were just in, manage security, and these users and my system users. This is a very key distinction in terms of using FileMaker. First off, this managed security area deals with users who are allowed to use FileMaker and use your database in a particular way. But these users have nothing to do with what can users do in your system. Your system, just like FileMaker, is completely developed based on your needs and the solution that you're developing. Therefore, you need to track and manage your users in your own database as well as in FileMaker. And there's a very easy way to do this. So we need to create some data structure into this file that sort of mirrors what FileMaker has. Mir FileMaker has a list of user accounts and in our database, we need to have a list of user accounts. So that dictates that we need a user table. So as we go into our manage database and we go into the tables area, this is super easy to add. There's two tables that we're going to add at this point in time. One of them is users. And I just type that in. Hopefully my head's not blocking that. We click create and I'll move it off to the side. Actually zoom out a little bit and move it off to the side. The next thing that we're going to create is a logging table. Now what you call this can be up to you. Some people think of it as events that happen throughout the course of time while the database is being used. Other users just simply call it a log. So the second table we're creating is a log and you're going to end up with this situation right here where we've got users and we've got log. Now we always have our default fields that we typically put into every uh, table and I already have those in either the project or the time. I know that they're there. I'm just going to double click here, scroll up a little bit and get all of my standard fields. All of my standard fields are these right here, my suite of modification and creation fields, as well as my ID. 
So I'm going to copy those to the clipboard with a command C, switch over to my users and put in a uh, click into this area because FileMaker was selected in here, click here and paste, I get all of my default fields. Now, all that I need is the things that are specific to what FileMaker tracks in terms of accounts. FileMaker identifies a user that logs in using a function known as, and I'll just type it in the field name here temporarily so that we can see it. I'll do it in the comment, get account or account name. There we go. So that right there is an internal uh, FileMaker function that is locked to the name that the user uses when they log in. So if I log into this database with admin, that's what this particular function is going to return. Nobody can actually change it. So what we're going to do is we're going to mirror that with a field simply called account name. So with account name, it's going to be a text field. We're going to simply create that field we are not going to set this to be a auto enter value. This is where we're going to set up a structure so that when the user logs in, we automatically get to capture the fact that they've logged in and we can capture the fact when they log out and we can store things specific to the user in terms of what they prefer. So in other words, this user's table is going to be super valuable to us because it allows us to store things specific to the users of the actual database system. One of them in particular might be, say for example, preferences. So each user prefers to do things differently in different ways. Let's say a manager prefers when they enter your FileMaker database to go to a particular layout versus a data entry user. These different classes of users can be identified by the role that they're coming in, the account that they're using, um, all kinds of different situations. The location that they're coming in. If somebody's using an iPad, you can actually determine this person's using an iPad. That means maybe they're out in the field and they're a sales rep. When they come into the system, let's direct them to a different layout. You get full control. Let's control that with preferences. Now, creating just a general single field called preferences, we're doing this just for the purpose to know that we want to store preferences. And there are so many ways in FileMaker to store preferences on a user by user basis. I could create multiple fields. I could create a preference for a preferred layout when the user enters into the system. I could create another field for a way that this user prefers to see things in descending order versus ascending order on a particular layout. Obviously, the options are limitless. But you can also do it all within one field. It's an advanced way of doing things, but remember all you're storing is one little piece of information. So if for example, I wanted to combine multiple preferences together using little bits of information, FileMaker has these things called variables and we've covered them and we'll cover them again when we evolve this system, I could store them all within one field. Remember, it always comes down to how much you have to manage in your solution. If I want this database to grow in terms of the number of fields and I'm confident about my naming strategy, then go ahead, create a new field for all of the different individual types of preferences. If you're the type of developer well, where you like to manage all of the preferences, say in memory, in global variables, and then store them into a single field called preferences, which is what I prefer to do, then just use a single field. It keeps your tables really narrow and trim. It all boils down to how you want to develop in FileMaker. So with these settings right now, we have almost everything that we need in order to capture what happens when the user logs in. We need to do a couple of other things. If you reflect on a couple of videos ago, or if you want to go back, you can go back to those other videos that we took a look at. Our file options, what we've done is we've set on the file options, when we take a look at them, for FileMaker to automatically come to a specific layout. Now I talked about this in a previous video and I'll give you the reminder. The way that FileMaker remembers what layout to start up on is in this order. The first thing is, what was the last layout that FileMaker was showing when the file was closed? And that's if this option is not selected. Next. What is the first layout that FileMaker is told to go to according to the file options? And that's right here, switch to this layout. And currently we're switching to a developer layout of startup. 
The third, and the where you have the most power, is with a script trigger of the on first window open. So this is number three, and this is where I typically put my destination. So first off, we're starting on a blank empty layout. We know that startup is an empty table with no fields, at least not yet. And that's a very fast startup. After that point, we then decide based on whatever criteria where we're going to take the user. So for right now, what we're going to do is we're going to zoom out here and we are going to go into our relationships and we're going to create a new structure. Now, remember, FileMaker throws these onto the relationship graph as soon as you create the tables. And by default, one of the things I do is simply just go into each one of these and say, okay, you're going to be as the default first table occurrence from my first creation of a table. You're just going to go over here and I'm going to put you in my uh, developer tables. From there, I make copies of them. So what we need now is we need an actual startup layout. We need to reassign what that layout is going to be because on startup, that's where we're going to check whether a user exists or not. So here I'm going to double click, rename this to just simply startup. It is going to be my table occurrence that's my initial startup uh, where the user starts up. So now I need to go switch that back in the file settings. So we're going to go to file. Oh, actually, um, I need to change the layout itself. We need to do that. So we'll go to manage layouts. And because this is changing from being a developer specific table for me to a user interface table, meaning I could potentially use the startup. In fact, I have a great video here on YouTube um, called startup splash screen or something like this, where I talk about everything I'm talking about now, but I show uh, that I use this for the purpose of a splash screen. I'm going to duplicate this table and I'm going to make it a user interface table. Now you're going to see if you've been looking or watching as I reassign this to my startup. So what we've done is we have set uh, the layout name to simply be startup that matches the layout of the table occurrence name that in turn points to the startup table. What I'm doing is this is a user interface table. So I am putting this into my layouts. Currently, I have not started to manage layouts in a way where uh, I can see where they're actually used. So to me, startup is just part of the whole of the application where I've got my layouts. I might want to, I will start to create subfolders. Let's go ahead and do it now while we're here. Zoom out a little bit, see if I can access that folder menu and add um, time. I'm just gonna put time for right now or time track. So this is my primary user interface. First, I've got my application folder. Then I've got my startup. Everybody's gonna see that. Then I've got layouts and I've got time and I'm going to be able to then put them right in here. And I think edit projects might go in there too. All right, so now I've got a layout that I can actually associate to. I'm going to switch, do I have that layout here? Startup, there it is right there. I'm going to go into the file options. So going back to the file options, now we're going to switch off of that developer layout because we don't want to use that one. We're going to switch to our user interface layout of startup. And we're going to say, okay. All right, so we've modified our solution now so that this layout startup is the layout that we come into. So that means that our context is not this table occurrence, it is this table occurrence. And in order to check for whether or not our system has a user, now again, I need to make this distinction clear so that it makes a lot of sense. When we go to manage security and we have our accounts here, this is the list of accounts that I create or if you're using external authentication that are managed by Active Directory of users who can get into my FileMaker system. But now my FileMaker system needs to know who these users are, and it's very easy to track them or to create them automatically. And that's what we want to do. So in our startup table, we're actually going to create a field. Now you remember I said that I typically do not add anything to the startup. Now, maybe that was a lie, but I do not add anything of consequence to my solution with regards to performance, meaning it's not loading any data tables, which is what a lot of uh, new FileMaker learners do. They jump into a projects table and maybe not all users need to see projects. So we do need a field in this startup table and it's gonna be pretty easy because it's an unstored field. So we're going to put in unstored 
Um, and I just do this out of habit. I don't know why. Sometimes unstored fields, I do not make them capitalized. Sometimes I do. It probably violates my own naming conventions. But to me, I like to know that a global field, which is when I typically capitalize a uh, the name of a field, if it's going to be a global, um, sometimes you will find them uh, capitalized, sometimes not in my system. And it's just uh, probably a bad habit. I should come up with a way to do that. But this is going to be a calculation field. Now remember what I said is the FileMaker function, and I can switch the context if I want here, but it really doesn't matter in this particular situation. Notice that by default, and we had a really good video where we talked about the context of the evaluation of a calculation. It's based on what you want that calculation to be able to see in terms of the data that it is connected to. In this situation, it really doesn't matter because the the result of this calculation is just one of FileMaker's environment functions, which is get account name. So remember, a user can't spoof this, they can't fake it. When they come in, if they've gotten into the FileMaker system, get account name is returning the account name from the security and privileges that we know that this user logged in with. So we are going to make sure and switch this to a text type, because it is, choose our storage options, and we are going to choose do not store this calculation results. And we're going to say OK. So with this into the field now, we can start to create some relationships that will help us out. One of them is going to be connecting to our users. So here's how we follow along. We name this the same connection that it actually is in terms of its context of use, or at least that's what I do. So I'm connecting from startup, startup users. Likewise, I'm going to make a copy of this by option dragging, and this one I'm going to call it the log. FileMaker will rename it right there for me as long as I haven't uh, put any, rena any renamed the actual name here. Startup log, because I'm going to want to do the same thing. So what we're going to be able to do is we are going to be able to actually generate a record when the first time that the user logs into a system by simply just doing this little wire up. I'm going to drag here, hover over the little arrow, go to account name, and right there have my relationship of one to many. I'm going to double click the relationship and of course choose this option of allow creation of records in this table via this relationship. So as it stands, the primary table occurrence or and the layout which my file is specified to drop into is this table occurrence. And this table occurrence, using an unstored calculated field of the count name that the user used to log in the system, is looking at the user's table. And the relationship says you are allowed to create related records. So there's a setting that we need on that field. What do you think it might be in my user's table on the account name? Because currently we have no settings on this particular field. What would you like to put? because you would like to never have multiple users. You never want to have multiple users. This wants to be a mirror of your actual accounts. So I'm going to double click this field and I'm going to say validate and make sure that this is a unique value. I only ever want one user in this. And in this scenario, I can choose to never allow users to override. This is something I'm going to completely control via scripting, what have you, and please always, always, always validate this. Never, ever, ever do I ever want to have a duplicate user. Um, I'm not going to take the time to display a custom message because typically I will take over this process if there ever is a duplicate that might happen according to my bad scripting. But this is going to be what I want to have happen. So now what we're going to do is we are going to set up what happens when the user logs in. We need a script. So on our startup layout here, I'm going to go into layout mode, get rid of this field that FileMaker automatic, automatically added. I typically get rid of the footer. I select the header. I get rid of it. Um, if I'm going to use it as a splash screen, I'm just going to put a uh, pretty picture here that I know this is the layout that we end up on. Um, first thing, so my startup script, can uh, choose to pause, it can center the window, do all kinds of things at this stage, but it can also check users. So let's create that script that we need. I don't have any folder organization right now. We're going to need to start to add that because 
As soon as you get past 10 scripts, you're going to need to have that organization. I won't take the time to do it right now, but I'll probably add it in to the next version of the file. So I'm going to create a script called check user. Now there's a number of things that you can do in this particular situation with regards to checking the user, all kinds of different settings. Typically this script, most scripts, you want to isolate to singular functionality. And that's what I'm going to do here. I am going to have the uh, assumption that this script is operating within the proper context. And that's what, with all scripts, you assume that they operate within the proper context, but it is possible to check in your scripts if you're in the proper context. Now we're not going to add it in today's lesson, but we will get to the point where we can actually check for the proper context. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set field right here of the account name. I'm going to look, because I'm assuming the context is my startup layout, I'm going to assume that in the users that my account name, which is not using an auto enter, is simply going to set the value of that same function, get account name, right there. Now there's a couple of things that I can do in terms of my scripting. We haven't gotten to it yet, is I'm going to teach you how to evaluate whether you need logic or not, certain pieces of logic, but I can do this. This is a very common thing for users to do. I can say if is empty, the startup users account name and move that step up and have this type of structure right here. So when this script runs or when my startup script runs, one of the things that I'm going to do is check whether or not the a user exists. I'm going to say if the account name is empty, meaning my database system, a user has logged in, they were given a FileMaker account, but they currently aren't in my database system. So I couldn't manage preferences for them, etc., what have you. Remember, the relationship allows you to create the record, so this is pretty much all I initially need in order to create that user. Where is this check user going to go? Um, let's go ahead and create a folder, and I'm going to call that folder application, and then we'll create another folder, and I'm going to call that startup and I just tend to think of my startup shutdown process as the whole same thing. So all of these scripts, uh, the shutdown included, are going to end up going into my application startup folder. These are all probably going to go into layout folders specific to the layout part of my solution. So check user, that means that on startup right now, this is taking me to my target layout. Well, I'm going to perform script of check user. So that is part of my startup. So why not put it in the actual startup script? Because there may be other times that I want to check for whether or not I have a user record. Now granted, the first time that this hits, the first time that a user logs into the system and their user record is created, from that point on I'll have the user record. But this is when I want it to actually ha uh, have it happen. And I might want to check before I switch my context. Very important in FileMaker. We have to remember the sequence in which things happen. I know that my file options are set to land on startup. I'm on startup and before anything else happens I can do things. The script that's going to run is the on first window open. That's this script right here so I don't want to go to another layout and change my context before I actually do the operation of checking the user because it expects that the context is my startup table occurrence. So a very important thing when you're learning that the order of operations matches where you expect to be and when you want things to happen. So this check user with all of my settings turned on should actually create my user records. The only thing that will prevent user records from being created is this right here. If when you are creating your security and you are setting things up and you're setting up your privilege set. The user is going to be logging in with this privilege set. This test user is going to be using the user privilege set. If on this privilege set you have done more complex logic with regards to restricting what users can and can't do, then what you're probably going to have is maybe situations like this where on any of these, if the create in the users or the log table 
does not allow you to create records right here where this is say set to no, because typically you don't want to let a user privilege set to create user records. Maybe they're trying to uh, somehow hack into the FileMaker database and create a fake account that they know is Bob's account and take over it or something like this. So you're typically going to limit what they can do here but you still you want your script to work. So if I say okay with this right now, saying yes, they can view users, which I'll, I would probably turn, or edit would definitely get a no. You're not going to be able to edit users. You're not going to be able to do with anything with regards to direct access to the fields. I'm going to allow you to do things through my scripts. Knowing that scripts are king and that scripts can do what I want them to do, maybe I say, Yes, this user account should be allowed to create users in the user's table. Um, but if I turn it off, meaning I'm not going to let them do it as a data entry person, knowing that my script is going to be able to do it, I have to give my script a full access or the ability to actually do that. Um, users, ultimately what we would end up with is with a user's table, we would end up with logic that would be a little bit more complex for editing. We would say, if the um, creation account, let's see if we've got it right here. In the users table, if the a creation account name equals the get account name, we'll go ahead and add it right here since we're here, then we would allow them to edit the record, meaning only the user that's logged in will be able to make changes to their user record. No other user can make changes to any other user's record. And hopefully that makes sense through our simple calculation right there. So, so far we've got this view. Heck, we might as well turn it off here too. Uh, if I do that, that's a bummer. Um, view has to be on and I have to go set that again. There we go, fine, thank you FileMaker. So I guess you have to have view in order to have edit. So we'll go ahead and leave that right there. We can always control whether or not they can get to a layout and view that in the layouts area of access. So we would be able to change that right here by saying they couldn't view a layout if we provided one. But with those settings on that, making, it, making the privilege set more restrictive, and I'll type in admin and my blank password, what this script needs to do, this check user, is the account if I don't allow the creation of records in the security itself, because I just really don't want to risk that, I need to right click this now and choose this option of grant act full access privileges. Meaning when this script runs as part of my startup process, no matter what, this script will allow the, it will create the user's record. So this should work now. By setting that setting alone, we can test this out and take a look at whether we've set up the proper structure. And we're going to do that just by doing exactly what a user would do, logging in and out as a user. And we want to check that. So I am going to go to my manage layouts. We probably have a layout of users right there that FileMaker created for us. It's not going to have the proper settings, but I will double click it, click views. Um, I want the default view to be table view. I'm going to take off my list and my what have you. Oh, I like my other settings right there in views. Let's go ahead and set those. I like to turn on all of these for my tables and make my lines really light. It's just something that I am used to doing in terms of how I like to see my developer tables. Move that up to my developer tables. And we say open that. We currently have no data. So now is when we get to uh, test our work. So let's make sure that as a byproduct of users coming into my system, they get a user record created for them. Then we know that we're going to be able to uh, log them as having logged in, logged out, manage their preferences, do all kinds of things. So let's close this and we will close the file. Don't wanna save changes to my layout and we will log in by simply choosing open recent. And we've got time track and the database just opens up. Now that by default is because my uh, access is set to by default use the admin account. Let's take a look at our table and see if it was created. Going into manage layouts, it was not actually created. So we would need to debug this script in order to see whether and what happened in terms of that startup process. And we can do that. Let's go ahead and debug. So with a copy of FileMaker Advanced, I can open up the script debugger. I've got that off screen right there. 
and we will go and open that recent. Great way to uh, debug your scripts is I love open recent. So we open time track and see what happens. So on startup, we can see right here, the startup layout is the layout according to the file options. We are performing the script of check user, which should be running, um, well, I'm logging, I'm logged in as admin because that's set as the default account. If I advance this, I can see what's going to happen here. Need to zoom out a little bit, see if I get any errors. Let's uh, see, is empty, startup account name and set field, record is missing account name. There's a reason that I'm not able to uh, create that account and it may be, probably somebody said it in the chat, but let's figure out why. I can't. Why that full access script is not able, and we switch to the layout right there. So that's our problem, we're not able to create that record. Let's see why, what's wrong with my relationship. All right, so get uh, unstored account name. We check the account name in the stored. It is a calculation. It is returning get account name. Storage options are off. We go to relationships. Startup account name, unique. It should allow the creation of records. By setting it to unique, you notice that we went to a one-to-one uh, -one relationship, an unstored one-to-one -one relationship where we only allow one because we set that unique value on there. Um, why is it not actually creating? This might be a good time to see if uh, anybody mentioned anything in the chat quickly. Let's see, user table, users are people too. Why not add them to that table? Uh, good question, we'll get to that. Um, poor at startup, now you are la uh, left alone <laughs> to rot in a corner. Um, interesting. Why is this not working? I always hate time taking the time on a vid on a live video, taking the time to debug why something is working, and I didn't use a reference on this situation. Um, I might be able to defer until the next lesson and get this working. Um, account name, how would I debug this? Well, let's take a look and see how I would actually debug this. I am going to go to a manage layouts. I'm going to go to my startup layout. I'm going to open that and I am going to start to debug this. That would be why we don't have a record in our startup table. So again, as we've learned in the previous uh, lessons before, because I don't have a record. Now this is, oh, I love this. This is a great lesson. I'm going, I'm already at 42 minutes, but I'm going to go over because this gives us the opportunity to learn about defensive coding. So, when we're using this ability to, for, to tell, have FileMaker create a related record through a relationship, if FileMaker doesn't have a record, which we've already taken a look at, and uh, Siva Kumar in a previous video showed me, uh, or mentioned it in the chat, but I was just going and going along, I didn't check all of the things that they were all in the right place, and right here we've hit the exact same thing, we don't have a record in our startup. What we do at this point in time is we don't just create the new record and then rely on the fact that it's now going to work. We program our scripts so that the scripts account for those situations. So this is when we take the opportunity. We go into our scripts, we take a look at our check user, and we put the logic in the script that says what's going to happen if we don't have records. So we add a new step, a uh, new step, and we say if get total record count does not equal one, so in other words, the startup table should only and always forever only have one record because we need the record in order to create related records through the relationship. So if that is the case, then what we're going to do is whatever we want to do. Uh, maybe we want to show a custom dialog, and this is terrible to do to users, but we're going to do it. Absolute total failure. <laughs> Uh, please contact the developer. Now in this particular situation, this is terrible to ever tell a user, uh, error, fail, that's it. Leave them with that. I'm gonna turn off the commit, I'm going to turn off the cancel and give the user pretty much no options. But that, to me, this is a developer situation where as I move that up, if this comes up, the first time that it comes up, it'll never come up again because I'm going to fix the problem. But I've put it into my script now that if I ever saved this database as a clone, 
and for some reason didn't have the record, the script is going to take care of itself. It's going to do what it needs to do to tell me that there's a problem. Now, I'm not even giving myself any additional information, and typically what I would do is have this wrapped around with an additional state that would say, and developer, which is a custom function I put into most of my databases that says, if this is happening when you're logging in as, an, as a master account user, this script will tell me, but other users, they just won't see anything. It just wouldn't work, which would be terrible to do to users. But now we want to test this again. This is the proper way to actually do this. I go and I open my recent, and uh, boom, I get this dialogue. Because I put the logic into the script, absolute total failure, please contact the developer. I know what the problem is. Other users wouldn't. It's a bogus dialogue, but we'll fix the problem. So let's switch to our startup layout. Let's create our new record with command N, control N if you're on Windows. Now let's close the file and I'm going to turn on my debugger and make sure that things work the way that they should. So I select my time track, my open recent. I step through with my debugger, which we will get into. There is one record and the record was created right there. So I am now managing my users. My user is, when I go to my layouts and take a look at my users developer table, there's my user. So the account was created in FileMaker and whether it's using external authentication or what have you, startup is hit, startup is empty, except for a calculation, uh, unstored calculation, looks to the users table, determines whether the user does or doesn't exist, creates the user record for me. From that point forward, with privileges, I will control whether that user can store preferences. We'll get into adding a log probably in another video. The final thing we're going to do to test this out so that you can follow along is we are going to go to our file options and we are going to turn off the login using the admin, meaning we are now going to do our test account and make sure that happens because it has the lower privilege set. So we close the file, we go to open our recent, of our time track and we get our dialog. Mine happens to be off screen. We put in our username of test. We expect that that script, even though I don't have access to modify or create records in the users table because the script runs with full access, we click sign in, we're signed in and at that point in time as startup, that created the user record for me. Now I'm going to need to close this and log back in as the admin user. Oh, I know why it keeps showing off screen. I've got another database open up off over there. I put in admin, and now I can go check that table of users with command shift L. There we go. The test user was created. So this is the starting process of how you manage users in your solution. If you'd like for homework, if you'd like to manage the process of tracking when a user logs in, when they log out, I'm going to give you the tips. All you're going to use is the um, on startup script and your on shutdown script, and you're going to create a similar structure, but it's it's going to be different. You're going to use a different uh, value here in terms of your log. Here's your hint. It's going to be based on time values. And we're going to take a look at this tomorrow where we actually just create a new log entry. And that log entry is the user logged in. And when you run the shutdown script, the user logged out. And all of this starts to give you the tracking that you like to have when you're managing a lot of users in your multi-user FileMaker database. It's the best way to go about it. It's super simple, super easy. And uh, I put it into every FileMaker solution that I have because it's a multi-user database. All right, so that's going to give us a wrap. Went a little, little bit long today, but I think I gave you all the information that I wanted to give you with regards to this topic. Quickly switch over, see if we did get any questions that came in about this. All right, we've got our mornings. What would be the security setup for developer assistant? Developer assistant, I'm trying to think. What would the security setup for a develop? Ah, developer assistant. We'll have to get, uh, jump here, we'll have to get into that when we talk about security at length. Um, the best answer I can give to that right now is that the way that you treat FileMaker security is in a few different ways. FileMaker security manages the users that you want to get into your system, but likewise, 
you can also use FileMaker Security to manage other types of developers that can get in, as he's mentioning right here when he uses the word a developer assistant. So if you have a developer and you don't want them to be able to uh, manage the full structure of the database, they're not going to have full access, but maybe they can get into certain layouts and design those layouts and add fields and move them around. All of those types of controls are in the managed security. Um, enabling all menus to users seems quite uh, dangerous. Um, it's all, when you enable all menus, when we made that switch from minimum to editing uh, is the other option to full menus, basically all you're doing is you're giving users access to all of the menus. Let's take a look on our desktop right here so that we have a good understanding. You are giving users access to um, all of these different commands. Now really what you have to do is evaluate which commands are potentially dangerous. For a sub account, a general user account, these two in particular are the most dangerous menu commands. Replace field contents and relookup field contents. So typically you never want to have those. You can always replace them by creating a duplicate menu set and taking them out or reassigning them to do something else. Otherwise, you're typically making the, the choice to choose to train and teach your users of FileMaker to use FileMaker the way that you use FileMaker as a developer, knowing how to do query by form, etc. Or you're teaching your users how to use your system the way that you want. And in that situation, you're usually replacing the full menu. You're creating your own menu set. You're not showing FileMaker's area, status area up here at the top. You're not letting users become familiar with that. You're hiding it, it goes away, and you're taking full control of the environment. A lot of solutions that I know of in the FileMaker consulting world, they teach users how to use FileMaker the FileMaker way, but then they just prevent access to certain menu commands like this. So when you do set the security to an all menus, it does give user access to these, and you just need to become familiar with which ones you do and don't want to have. If you choose, say, editing only, then you get a lot of the editing commands, but you maybe don't get some commands in records and so forth. You're going to have to play with those and switch them and see what menu commands are enabled and disabled versus the three options of minimum, editing, and um, all. With all, I typically set it to all because one of the problems is the way that FileMaker controls whether certain script steps run are based on whether the menu commands are actually enabled. So you actually come into a very big issue when you set the menu system to minimum or editing and you run scripts that expect to do certain things because the menu system doesn't have those actual menus enabled, your scripts don't do what, they, what you intend them to do. Remember, FileMaker is nothing more than a glorified automation environment for everything that you find in the menu commands and in dialogues. If you disable those menu commands, then they become inaccessible to a given privilege set. So that's the downside of sticking with minimum or editing. So hopefully that's a good answer to that question. And it's a good question and it's good information to know. All right. Let's see, any more questions? All right, user table, users are people. Well, the reason that we don't add them is because the users of a system aren't necessarily correlated to the people that you're managing in your system. You could do that, but because an account name is so much different than a username, if you wanted to, I would probably prefer to link them. So if I was going to manage my users in a people table, and again, if this doesn't make sense and you're watching this for the first time, you just dropped in this YouTube video, you're going to have to watch previous videos in this series. Um, a people table, you can manage the users of your system in your people table and then link them to your users table. And I would do that based on the account name, and maybe you wouldn't put the first name and last name of users in the users table, but of course you can. I'm always creating very basic tables here. You can expand them to whatever extent you want. Uh, start up now, you're left alone in a corner. All right, yeah, there we go. Uh, Lee is mentioning that we needed a record in startup, but it gave us the great opportunity to learn that we can defensively put into our uh, scripts logic so that that problem never happens again, or if it does happen, we give this really rude error. Uh, does it track logout based on user timeout? You know what, we're gonna take a look at that tomorrow because we didn't get the time to put it in uh, today. Uh, actually, uh, logging events more than just logging the user 
uh, when they log in and log out. But we will be adding that in if you're not able to do that on your own as a result of this video. Uh, my users are normally logged out based on a timeout. Um, that one we can look at because there are settings in, I'll have to remember this one, there are settings in um, the file settings where you log the user out by default and you can also set that on server to log users off automatically. Um, but no access to security. Yeah, we'd have to take a look at this in another video. All right. Very, uh, very critical piece of knowledge right there. Uh, knowing that the menu commands must exist in order for the script steps to actually run that use those menu commands. So I, that looks like our last question for today. So I think that's going to give us a wrap. Whoosh, long video today, 54. I got to figure out how to make these shorter. <laughs> but it's just so much information to cover. All right, so that's gonna bring today to a wrap. If you are interested in being notified, subscribe here on YouTube. Otherwise, go to the magazine website, subscribe there as well, and the next video in this series will be coming up right here. So thank you so much for tuning in, and until the next video, much luck with your own database, and happy file making.